Test. Test after test. the textbook and then we have a worksheet on reproductive and genetics. for the female reproductive system and then we're going to move on with chapter 29. Why did I do chapter this one, the hypothalamus, the gonadotropin-releasing hormone, okay? It's, that's the, even for male and for female, it starts with this one that tells the anterior pituitary to release its two hormones. And I'm not going to repeat the story, but you know what happens, okay? The follicle-stimulating hormone stimulates the follicle. LH is just for, to ovulate. And the, there's two things, two cells inside the follicle. One is the oocyte and the other one are the follicle cells. It's the follicle cells that utilize the cholesterol to make your estrogen progesterone, okay? And then we said that, so once we ovulate this, the egg, that is, the egg that's ovulated is not an empty egg, okay? It's surrounded by some of the follicle cells, it's protected, okay? And the follicle cells will be called corona radiata, which will be the next chapter, okay? Uh, and this egg that's ovulated, the oocyte, is arrested at metaphase two of meiosis two. That's it, okay? And then the, the, the um, follicle that released the egg will be called corpus luteum, and it's the one that's maintaining your increased levels of estrogen, progesterone. But at that point, when you ovulate, progesterone takes over. It's higher, right over here. So if you look at this slide, those birth control pills have high levels of progesterone. 
it feeds negatively to the brain. It prevents your brain from secreting FSH and LH. Because FSH is the one that will start. It will tell a set of follicles to keep going and then you ovulate. So all of those uh, contraceptive pills, they prevent ovulation by inhibiting the release of FSH LH. That's what they do. So you have no eggs. The eggs remain to be primordial follicles. They're not recruited, okay? So remember that towards term, we studied this already, right? Towards term, uh, there'll be this hormone relaxin. That's also the result of the baby, right? We discussed that one, if you are pregnant, the baby, the cells of the baby will secrete beta HCG or human chorionic gonadotropin. I'm not writing it down because I wrote it last week. I'm sure you remember that, the beta HCG. And the beta HCG is the one that keeps this corpus luteum active for another uh, eight weeks or so, just giving the baby time to make placenta. The placenta is a tissue that's communication between the mom and the, the baby, which we're going to cover in the next chapter. But until that is fully functional, the baby ensures that this remains corpus luteum. Once the placenta is fully functional by eight or 10 weeks, then this becomes corpus albicans, which is okay because the placenta becomes like the artificial ovary that still maintains high levels of, of progesterone. And then, like I said, towards term, the baby starts secreting cortisol, which stresses the mom. So you notice, oh, we're gonna talk about that in depth. But have you heard of what you call for false labor, Braxton Hicks, con Braxton Hicks contractions? Mm -hmm. yes. The reason for the false labor pains is Remember what we said when we were studying the muscle? When the muscle is stretched, it responds by contracting. So when the, your uterus grows, the muscle is stretching, so it will contract. So those are Braxton Hicks contractions. The sustained contraction is dictated by the baby. When it secretes cortisol and it reaches the mother, the mother responds by releasing, increasing levels of oxytocin. Now you can see that there's regular contraction. That's labor, okay? That's real labor, um, as opposed to your Braxton Hicks. At the same time towards term, the, uh, the placenta will start secreting relaxin to relax the cervix and start opening up so delivery can be successful. I just wanted to make sure that we can we touched on this one remember it's the brain that controls regulates everything whether you're male or female when you're given a list of hormones and you're asked which do you think is the origin or what starts everything you're going to choose the brain and if you have this for a choice you're going to choose that because this is the main regulator this the hypothalamus is the key, it will stimulate the anterior pituitary. And once it starts that, it goes on every month. In males, it's not monthly, it's all the time, right? It's just negative feedback. It's, it's still cyclical, but it's not monthly. Okay, now we're going to go to the very last chapter. <laughs> chapter 29. For this chapter, we're just, we're not going to go into detail, including genetics. Are you familiar with Punnett Square? Mm -hmm. That's as much as I go for, for genetics. Just a few terms, phenotype, genotype. We're not going to go, we're, we're going to talk about co-dominant or the blood typing, but just that, okay? So this one answers one 
the once you become a zygote, this is your first baby name, what's next? Okay? So you should be familiar with the term fertilization. Fertilization is where the sperm and the egg meet, specifically the secondary oocyte and the spermatocyte. Okay? This one will be, are you familiar with eggs, right? The eggs that you buy in the store, you have to crack it open so that you can get to the egg. It's the same thing here, okay? Let's look at what the sperm must do to be able to meet up with the egg. So this slide, you must remember. The, let's, let's review our meiosis. Remember for the female, all of our eggs are in, they are arrested at prophase one of metaphase one. When we're born, all of the eggs are prophase one, metaphase one, meaning there's 96 chromosomes, so there's 23 X plus the copy of that 23 X that you inherited from one parent, let's say from the mom, and you inherited another 20, oh, sorry, not 23, 22 X. You have a total of 23 chromosomes, 22 autosomes plus the sex chromosome. So 20, that's 23, okay? And then the other one is another 22 X. This may be the one that you inherited from your dad plus the copy. So this is the egg that, that is in your primordial follicles. Then they sleep, then at puberty, increasing levels of FSH and LH, this will proceed, right? That's the job of follicle stimulating hormone. It's stimulating a cohort of follicles to proceed. So this will undergo prophase one, I'll continue, metaphase one, anaphase one, telophase one, and after that you're going to produce two. This is your primary, oocyte, what's produced is your secondary oocyte, right? So one will contain the half plus the copy of that half, that's 46 chromosomes. This is what we call the secondary oocyte, and then this one is the other half plus the copy. <coughs> this is what we call the first polar body, right? This is your polar body first polar body. So this one, this secondary oocyte, will continue, will immediately go through prophase two, metaphase two, right? And so it will go look like this, where the First, the 22X is on one side and the other one is in the other. So they're in the center, right? Metaphase two of meiosis two. This will be metaphase two of meiosis two. And this is what we ovulate. And so here is the egg that's ovulated. There's the polar body. Do you see the polar body right there? Where's my pointer? Oh, right here. Do you see? <coughs> There's the polar body, which means this first polar body has 46 chromosomes, right? 22X plus the copy. It's haploid, which is this one. And then this one is this one. It, it's at metaphase. So first, these two sets, the 22X here, this 22X, and the other 22X, they were in the center, okay? That's what we ovulate, females ovulate. But if there's a sperm that successfully made it inside, that's the signal. You see, now they're moving away. Now they're in anaphase, anaphase two. So here is where this, this one, the first 22X, is going to meet up with these chromosomes from the dad, right? And this one is going to move away. This will become another polar body. 
And if this divided, you're going to have three polar bodies. One, two, three. Right? Do you have any question on what I just wrote or any question? So if this continued with cell division, you're going to have these two polar bodies and this another one. So there's meiosis produces four cells. Only one gets fertilized. So this one, before it finally forms a zygote, this is what you call ovum. Are you familiar with the word ovum? Right? You don't know the word ovum? Oh, ovum is ova, ovary. Ovum is the egg. That's the egg or ova. Okay. Do you have any question on this one? <coughs> um, I do. So, you say if the polar, if the first polar body continues, sometimes does it not? Not sometimes. It doesn't. It always does, right? It, there has no, to be it doesn't have to. Oh. Why? What's the purpose? Why will it divide? It's not yeah. going to be fertilized anyway. So in real life, it doesn't. It just undergoes a tissue. So the meiosis doesn't always produce the four cells. In males, it does. In, Got it. In females, but we no. always have that flow chart because students get confused. Okay. Just to remind students, meiosis does produce four cells if it's going to be successful. In females, it's just neat. What's Why will it? have yeah. to divide. There's no purpose. Because it's kind of like providing for the developing baby, right? They like, you say they sacrifice themselves? Yeah, that's why they're smaller. Mm -hmm. They're sacrificing their contents to the, so that one will be, you just need one healthy egg. Yeah. Yes? You good? You good? Last lecture, so please listen, okay? Especially for those who are struggling, it's your chance to really, yeah. We have lab on Wednesday, right? Just we're not gonna have lecture or no. like CSI period? No, we have lecture, we have a test oh. on Wednesday. <laughs> 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 I would, uh, can you direct your questions to this one? Question about this. Question, question. I mean, you know, the polarity. That's what I'm going to talk about now. Okay, so this is the egg that we ovulated. And you notice that the egg that's ovulated, it's not a naked egg. It's actually covered by a layer of the follicle cells. A few of them go with the egg to protect the egg. The, these follicle cells that have been ovulated with the egg is called corona radiata. You must memorize this. Do you see why the acrosome is very important? So you have all of these millions of sperm that makes it to the egg. A lot of them will have to weaken this corona radiata cells and then weaken this zona pellucida. The zona pellucida is a hard covering that the oocyte makes. It's like the eggshell. You need to know that anything that makes it, uh, anything that has sort of hardness needs cholesterol. So that's why females who have when their body fat goes to 12% and below, they don't ovulate. Okay? So, what, and then look, one, two, three, then break the plasma membrane of the secondary oocyte and finally land in there. Are you familiar with mitochondrial DNA, where they do mitochondrial DNA testing, right? <coughs> and it traces to the mom because the dad only, do you remember, <coughs> do you remember the sperm? 
there's the head and there's the neck where the mitochondria is and the flagella. What is the contribution of the dad? Nothing but the chromosomes. So when we test for mitochondrial DNA, we're actually testing for the mom. You trace that. It's, it's amazing if you study genetics, the mitochondrial DNA of each and every individual in the entire planet of Earth can be traced to just one female in Africa. That's called the mitochondrial Eve. There's just one female. Erwin. Very good question, yes. But this is amazing. The egg, you know what the egg does? It sort of opens up to allow one sperm and then it go, it's called reverse polysperm. It locks, makes this zona pellucida even harder and thicker to prevent another sperm from coming in. That's amazing. Because if there's another sperm, then that's not human. It's going to have more than 46 chromosomes. Mm -hmm. Yes, Simon. And then, okay, I'm, I'm thinking about the condition of the twins. Oh, twins. <laughs> twins can happen if there's what you call paternal twins and then monozygotic twins, right? Paternal twins, they're not identical. There's just two eggs that were fertilized by two separate sperm. Monozygotic twin means one zygote. One, one zygote was formed, and as the zygote was dividing, they separated. So they look alike. They're identical twins. So they undergo another meiosis? Not meiosis. It's just mitosis. After this one, it's all mitosis. So they separate. And if they don't separate, that is when they have to... <coughs> I'll show you uh, 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 an identical twin, okay? But the paternal twin is just two eggs fertilized by two separate sperm. It happens. And, and it came from uh, different ovaries for that month? Possible. Sperm split ups. There's always sperm that goes to the right ovary and the left ovary each and every time. But more than likely, it's from the same ovary. Ovaries take turns. Sometimes this one will ovulate, then next month is this one. Don't ask me why. I don't know why. Yeah. Yeah. Has there ever been a case where there has been two that got inside that you know of? Oh, two sperm? If there's two, it, it, you will not, it will not be, com it will not be, what well, COVID term. You will miscarry them. It, it's okay. not human. So, <laughs> thankfully. <laughs> okay. Okay, so you see, look, 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 Simon. <laughs> the contribution of the dad is just really the chromosome. There's the mitochondria. The mito it's just this one that goes in. So that's all that the dad contributes. Everything else comes from the mom. Okay? That explains, if you if you maybe watch, I like to watch forensic puzzle, mitochondrial DNA, that always traces to the mom because there's nothing, no organelle comes from the dad. The dad only gives the 23 chromosomes. I want you to know the term pronuclei. When the sperm and the egg, the egg is called ovum, right? Before they meet, before they form, because they still have to meet, remember here? They still have to meet up. At the, until they meet up and form the new baby, before you call it zygote, you call this pronucleus because it only has 23, and this is pronucleus. When they fuse to make the 46, then that's when you formally call it a nucleus. The fusion is called syngamy. Syngamy. And 
like I said, there is no match.com. Uh, as early as 30 minutes. No, 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 no. It takes only, can you imagine? This is amazing. I thought that's like, into once in, after sexual intercourse, it takes only minimum of 20 to 30 minutes for the sperm to make it to the ovary. So it's fast, right? <coughs> Not the ovary, I mean the fallopian tube because that's where fertilization happens. So they travel very fast. That's why they have to have those healthy sperm and they need their cereal bars so that they can <laughs> successfully make it up there. And then once they meet, there's no much, there's no time where I say, oh, let me see, do I, if I don't like it, oh, goodbye. No, there's no such thing, right? Fertilization happens within, well, within 30 minutes, but then in six hours, that's the minimum that they have recorded, in six hours to no more than 24 hours you're no longer a zygote. You're divided already, okay? When I realized when life first begins, I now understand, you know, the, the consequences of, you know, the, I don't believe in the after, what do you call, morning after pill or something like that, because if they meet, there's already the first baby. You're a zygote for a minimum of six hours. After that, you, you should write these new names. These are your baby names. Your first baby name is zygote. And then you're called an embryo. For the first eight weeks of life. And then from eight weeks until birth, your name is fetus they start thinking about your baby name. And then at birth, when you're born, you're called newborn. Newborn or neonate. You're a newborn or neonate for the first eight weeks after birth. And then from eight weeks until two years old, your name is infant. Of course, you have names already. You're an infant up to two years old. And then, what's the next one? Toddler? Okay. After that, what? Child. What else? Cream. <laughs> whatever. Pain. Pain in the butt, whatever, right? But please what know those names. Eight weeks to... Fetus is eight weeks to birth. Perfect. Yes. Okay, so zygote, please know those terms, zygote, embryo, fetus, and then neonate, infant, and then so on. But so now when, when you say, okay, there's fetal, whatever, right? When they use the word fetal, at least you now know. Okay, we're dealing with someone who's more than two months pregnant. Right? When we say embryo, it's just the first eight weeks of life. But this is us, right? We just start dividing, which is amazing. This is why they say the best contrast, if you don't want to get pregnant, then uh, abstain because it's very fast and you can't stop the cell division. So immediately after your zygote, a series of cell division will happen. What type of cell division is this? Is this meiosis or mitosis? mitosis. Yes, now we start dividing by mitosis. <coughs> and the term is called cleavage. Cleavage is just a fancy term for cell division, mitosis. So you see, from one to two to four to eight and so on. There's the polar body right there. One of these will have the 46 chromosomes, right? And the other one is the 23 from here. So there's the, the other polar body and there's the first. So one of them will have 46, the other one will have 23 right there. Okay? 
and keep dividing. Look, look at what happens. By day five, maximum one week, look at. The, the cells just divide around a central cavity. And there's two groups of cells. We call it blast, right? Osteoblast is the young bone cell. It's also called blast here. But there's two terms that you see here. One is called embryoblast. And the other one is called trophoblast. I wonder which group of cells becomes the baby. Embryoblast, right? Right there. It's also referred to as the inner cell mass. And then the trophoblast, the trophoblast actually becomes the part of this series of cell division. These are the group of cells that is responsible for invading the endometrium of the mom so it can implant. It's also the job of the trophoblast to weaken the tissues of the mom to form the placenta. What's the job of the embryoblast? To differentiate and become the baby. But you see, by day five, the first week, you don't even know you're pregnant yet, right? You miss your first period two weeks later. So, after about by seven days, the first week, you're already hidden inside. There's the endometrium, you're implanted inside. And the baby starts feeding on the glycogen, which is your uterine milk. Remember we said that the endometrium is filled with glycogen. Okay. Um, just to let you know, I, I'm not going to ask you what happens at the end of the first week or whatever. Don't worry about that. No implantation. All of this happens in, let's say, why don't we say in the first trimester? But in the first week, just so um, we can educate. We're learning so we can educate, especially the young ones, right? So they understand when life begins. Cell division happens. Life begins within six hours. Okay. And it's hidden. See, it imp the baby implants. Now we're going to call the baby embryo, right? And not yet, sorry. It's still six days. After, after eight weeks, then we call it embryo. Ah, I'm sorry. It's the baby's called embryo. Fetus in my mind is fetus is from eight weeks to birth. But this is a, a bigger view. You see the embryo blast showing you. You see the pink one, that's the trophoblast. This trophoblast secretes a lot of hyaluronidase. I'm not writing it down. These are just enzymes that help to weaken the tissue of the mom. You can see the blood vessel there. The goal is to reach the blood vessel because that's where new nutrients are going to come in. The glycogen in the endometrium is enough to sustain maybe first eight weeks. After that, the baby needs ingredients to be able to become what? All of its parts. Who provides the ingredients? The mom. Okay? That's why if you look at the store, you try to look at the basic, basic food items, and I'm talking about bread, that's basic. Cereal is basic. A lot of those items that are considered basic, that are common in, in households, look at it. it, it's loaded with a lot of ingredients that we need, like folic acid, because a lot of times we don't know we're pregnant there's already a baby growing in there and they will not be sustained by the glycogen alone. They need more because they need ingredients to make whatever they need, okay? So this is a summary, oh, summary. You see you ovulate and see fertilization happens in the fallopian tube, which you must remember, fertilization <coughs> happens in the fallopian tube, which means 
if we trace the sperm from when it lands in the vagina, you have to say it has to ascend through the cervix, up the uterus, up the fallopian tube, then crack open the corona radiata, no, weaken the corona radiata, crack the zona pellucida, cause a break in the cell membrane, finally meet the egg. Yes? Going back a step, is that the reason for craving? Craving, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure you've taken, a lot of you have taken nutrition. You know that any craving is the body telling you you need something. Have you ever had a craving for something sweet or something salty, even if you're not pregnant? Like, I'm sure the males also have cravings once in a while, right? Simon always does. <laughs> so th that at, at that time when you're craving for something, it's because you, you're, that's your body telling you you're. But that also explains the craving. Okay. Okay. So by this, but once the baby has implanted, and we're going to change the name, only zygote for first six hours. Look at Simon having a craving. <laughs> <laughs> then next, next embryo. Right? Remember, at that point, it's the, it's the baby. This baby is dictating. The baby, while the baby is dividing, the baby is also secreting beta HCG to sustain the corpus luteum of the ovary, right? And once the baby has implanted, the next thing to happen is to differentiate. This is called gastrulation where you're differentiating into three germ layers, okay? You see they're changing color here just to show you that these cells are now specializing. Instead of just generic cell, they will have a name called endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm. Are you familiar with that one? Endoderm. Mesoderm and ectoderm. The endoderm are the cells that will give rise, differentiate and give rise to your internal organs. The mesoderm are the cells that will differentiate to become muscle. And the ectoderm will differentiate to become your integumentary system and nervous tissue. Look at this slide. You can see the trophoblast cells right here, which has two names. You see one called cytotrophoblast, and the other one is called syncytiotrophoblast. Don't worry about this is too much, sorry, sorry. How about we just use the term trophoblast, okay? The trophoblast cells, which is different from the embryo, okay? The trophoblast cells, look at what they're doing. They're weakening the tissues of the endometrium of the mom. There's one endometrial gland I see here. There's blood vessels there because very soon it's gonna run out of glycogen. The baby needs to feed on some more. Do not worry about syncytial trophoblast and cytotrophoblast, okay? <laughs> Just the word embryoblast and trophoblast. Do you have any question on the difference between the two? Okay. So you slowly see that one of the job of the trophoblast cells also is to secrete fluid. That's what we call amniotic <laughs> fluid. And that's important to float the baby and also to wash up the baby. Whatever waste the baby has can be uh, uh, unloaded in the amniotic fluid. That's why we can do amniocentesis to look at the health of your baby. The, the, it contains a lot of chemicals that is from the baby and that's you. Okay? Was that the trophoblast? That, yeah. So this word gastrulation just means formation of the three germ layers, the endoderm, 
the mesoderm and the ectoderm. You see what's going on? You see there's your ectoderm, there's your endoderm, and then all of a sudden there's a group of cells in between that becomes meso. They just start specializing. What they did is they just were tracing what will this become? What will this become and what will this become? And they listed what organs come out of these three germ layers. Only three germ layers and all of your body systems will be formed from them. Okay? So there you are. You can slowly see what you see. It says 16 days after fertilization. So this is just what? Two days after the first two. You can see. There you are. And then I'm just going to skip this slide. Then you see this is a summary. The first part to be developed is actually your nervous system, which makes sense, right? Because it's the one that is important in homeostasis. So right there, okay? And then as the body systems are being developed, that's the embryo. The trophoblast is also, at the same time, the trophoblast is busy trying to weaken the endometrium part in this area to start forming the placenta, and that's called placentation. Very easy to make the placenta. And I want you, there, there's the baby. This should be by the first eight weeks this placenta should be fully functional. So then we can let the ovary go, right? We can let the corpus luteum become corpus albicans, but you have a fully functioning placenta. It's very important for you to know, look, look, there's, there's the baby. And you see it's developing its own set of blood vessels. And with this one, what connects the placenta to the baby is the umbilical cord. Note that the umbilical cord here, it says there's two umbilical arteries and one vein. The vein is the one that carries oxygenated blood. It's coming from the mom. The artery goes away from the baby, go to the mom. So the artery contains deoxygenated blood. And this is how it looks like. There's the placenta, there's the umbilical cord that has two arteries and one vein. And you should notice in this slide, you should notice that there's a complete, complete separation of blood vessels of the baby with the blood vessels of the mom. There is no mixing of blood. So babies can have a completely different blood type from the mom. The nutrients, this is the placenta, right? The nutrients travel from the mom to the baby just by typical passive transport, diffusion osmosis, that's it. There's no mixing. Possible mixing happens when the baby is born. There's a tear in the placenta, that's where possible mixing, and that's the scare when the baby is RH positive and the mom is RH negative. But all through the entire pregnancy, it's completely separated. However, even if it's completely separated, the fact that substances can move, right, by diffusion or osmosis, anything that is harmful to the baby from the mom can still make it to the baby. Okay, so after the first, within the first trimester, the organs are developed, and now next, next is the organs just start growing, okay? So right, no need, I, I don't require you to memorize what happens during the eighth week. It's just 
a brief overview. So within the first trimester, we develop our body organs. And then the second trimester onwards, we grow. In the first trimester, as we are, for, we start, how do we develop our body parts? We start from three germ layers, endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm, okay? At the same time, that's what's going on with us. At the same time, the trophoblast is also forming the placenta. So those are the two events going on in the first trimester. Then when we get to the second trimester, the next, in the second trimester and onwards, we just grow in size. But every single ingredient should be in place, which you need to know, okay? Something that we must be familiar with, you see, uh, see during the fetal period, which is from eight weeks onwards, right? It just, it just grow, it's just growing. That's a good question. Oh, oh, oh. So where's the second trimester? by the end of the 12 weeks. But look, this one, there's your fertilization. And then, I like this because it's really, it's nice, you see, by 24 hours, you're not just two cells, you're really many cells. And then you start implanting, and then start differentiating. So we, we discussed there are two things going on in the first trimester, right? One are the changes in the embryo, and the other one is the placenta being formed. So you must know the trophoblast and the embryoblast. They're busy. They both have their own job to do. And then this slide is very important. The, when we start educating, especially the young people, right, it's very important. Have you ever? You know what they say? They say that the, if you take nutrition, when you get to prenatal, don't they have a big statement there that the single most important factor <coughs> that determines the health of every single one of us is prenatal nutrition, okay? So we are not only worried about how the baby looks like when they're born, Babies can be born fully normal, but there can be like chromosomal defects that you can't even see. So when they get old, like, have you ever heard of some people, ah, oh, I have asthma, I didn't know, I'm just, I'm the first in my family, or I'm the first to become a diabetic, or I'm the first to have hypertension, and so on, and all those kinds of problems. It traces to the prenatal. It's during pregnancy that you have to provide the ingredients. If, di di didn't we say, the first trimester we have to provide ingredients. Second trimester, ingredients must be there already. All they need to do is to grow. If you give them the incomplete ingredients, maybe they'll be normal, but then they have all kinds of problems when they get old, right? Or there can be obvious problems when the baby is born. And I always use the example of my nephew. Um, his mother, six months pregnant, but she said she didn't know she's pregnant. Mm -hmm. Six months later, drinking wine, nonstop drinking. So my nephew has fetal alcohol syndrome. He is almost 30 now. When you talk to him, he's what? His voice is like that, and he's, but he's, you know, he's, he's able, he's okay. He's, he's just not as other people, but he's a chef, so that's a good thing, right? But this slide, this is what you call, have you heard of the term critical window? Mm -hmm. The critical window refers to you, the, it's, it's a big responsibility on the mother's part, right? That's why it's like, you know, if females get pregnant, the spouse should really spoil them up. Because it's, it's a big responsibility. Look, in the first trimester, if something happened, let's say the mother got, got an infection or something, what's possibly going to be harmed or compromised is the nervous system of the baby, as well as the cardiovascular system. 
And towards term, by the sixth month, if something happened, right, exposed to cigarette smoke or whatever, it's the respiratory system of the baby that can be compromised. And this is the sad news, right? Have you heard? That's why there's some, the teenagers, the teenage, because they don't know, they say, oh, have you heard this comment where they say, um, it's going to upset their figure. So they say, oh, I'm okay. I'm, I'm just not going to eat that much. I'm going to wait until my baby's born. And then they say, that's the time I'm going to feed the baby so my baby becomes. No, that's wrong. Because that, it's when the baby is inside that you have to give what it needs. When the baby is born, the baby should be born with everything. If the baby, there's something missing, maybe chromosomal defect. Like I said, there's a lot of those defects that don't show. It's like maybe minor things, so you're just prone to, let's say, high cholesterol, or you're just prone to hardening of the arteries. There's minor things, but it traces to prenatal. And I thought, whoa, that's amazing, but that's true. Okay, so do you have any question on this slide? Yeah. What happens if the mom is under severe stress? Oh, that's a very good question. If the mom is under severe stress, there can be a threat of um, miscarriage, right? So as abortion, spontaneous abortion, or it can also upset with the endocrine system of the baby. Mm -hmm. Is that why we have to <coughs> take uh, prenatal? The prenatal vitamins, yeah, they give, they, they always prescribe prenatal vitamins just to make sure that we're providing all that the baby needs, okay? Any question? Any question on when life first begins? Oopsie. It's important so that because we're all going to be going into some kind of health practice, so at least you can um, really educate and tell them that this is something what's going on. Well, they deserve to be spoiled, right? They deserve to eat proper diet. Have to be proper diet. Okay. So this slide is a summary of the hormones. Remember HCG, which is made by the baby. It, it rescues the corpus luteum for the first eight weeks of life. And then after that, the placenta should be fully functional. So it can take over the secretion of this. Which one is the pregnancy hormone? Progesterone B for pregnancy. So you have to have high levels of progesterone to maintain pregnancy. And then towards term, the placenta, which is dictated by the baby, starts secreting high levels of relaxing. There's two things that this does. It, it, um, it softens the cervix, makes it to dilate uh, uh, faster, or easier, and it also relaxes the synthesis breathing, widening your hips so you can easily give birth to the baby. And of course, the HCG starts going down, cortisol goes up, and right here. So, um, childbirth is actually nothing but like a modified menstruation. See, towards birth, look at what's happening. The progesterone is now going down. That's a sign that you're about to give birth, or if it's not this long, it's menstruation. Okay. So what are the changes during pregnancy? Very easy, right? Oh, remember, lordosis is the tendency that can happen to the abnormal curvature just because of the big baby. All of this can be explained by the next slide. Right here, look at the baby pushing all of those organs to the side. So, and you know the bladder is there, that's why there's urinary frequency, right? You can't hold as much PT. Look at where your, where's your stomach? It's missing, it's pushed up there. <laughs> your colon, that's why you can't be constipated. Uh, if, if you become pregnant, that's the time that maybe you can, uh, sorry. You can actually, you can flood the toilet, right? <laughs> See, the, it, the, the movement is slower. See, right there. And what, what about its effect on the respiratory system? Right? It can also affect, very difficult. All of those is because of the baby, the 
boss all the way, right? So I think he should say thank you. <laughs> so now when it's time to give birth, when we're going through uh, regular contractions, that's because of oxytocin, which is positive feedback mechanism. Don't forget it's a positive feedback mechanism. We discuss cortisol, we discuss cort uh, relaxin, we discuss oxytocin. And actually what happens is this head of the baby, this head of the baby, there's two things. There's two things that increase the contraction of the uterus. The increasing levels of oxytocin, number one. Number two, this head pushing against the cervix because the cervix is also muscle. So when the head pushes against the cervix, it, uh, and, and this lower part of the uterus, remember stretch, contract, it starts undergoing powerful, it's like the baby trying to push itself out. And so it's those two things, the pushing of the head of the baby plus increased oxytocin triggers nonstop contraction of the uterus so that the baby gives birth. I'm always laughing at this line because they they make it like it takes one hour, what is that? <laughs> so the first thing when you go in, when the baby is about to be delivered, the uh, cervix dilates, you're going to practice, right? You have to practice. I hope you get to do pelvic exam. So you go inside and you check the diameter of the cervix. You should measure your two fingers how wide it is. The, mine is 3 cm. Then you can practice, practice. You can measure how wide is the cervix. If you can volunteer or rotate, do that. Then you'll know, oh, fully dilated. Oh, 6 cm dilated. It's just estimate. It's all estimate by experience. Right? So. When the baby, when the baby's head is crowning, next is expulsion. You know this expulsion has several stages, internal rotation, flexion, external rotation. And I, I like <laughs> to tell the story of when I was going through, before I, my first delivery, I was memorizing the difference because I wanted to see internal rotation. I wanted to see that I am so blessed because I had a long lab coat. I didn't have time. When the baby came out, I had to catch with my lab coat. Otherwise, the baby would have fallen on the floor because I wanted to see. And so I want to tell you, this is deceiving. This is like in seconds, it's over, okay? And then after the baby is delivered, the uterus will still contract. That contraction of the uterus accomplishes two things. It separates the placenta and it promotes contraction of the blood vessels. So there will be controlled bleeding. So you have, so what's the first one to come out? Of course, the baby next, the placenta. The placenta must come out. So the uterus cannot be relaxed. It has to come out, okay? And then finally, you're done. Baby is out. What's the next thing to do? Breast your baby. Mm -hmm. I was going to say something I forgot related to this one. Okay. Okay. So now it's time to breastfeed. There's two hormones we must remember, prolactin and oxytocin. Prolactin is the hormone to make milk. So it tells the mammary glands to make milk. Just a minute. And then oxytocin is the one that tells the myoepithelial cells to squeeze the milk out. There's muscle cells actually that I, like, like your hair, have, are you familiar with goosebumps, right? The hair stands up. That's the same thing. There's smooth muscle at the base of the mammary glands. When they contract, they squeeze the milk out. And, the, and that's related to oxytocin, which is stimulated as the baby sucks or breastfeeds. Simon. Uh, Astrician, when the, uh, the 
the taxation of the service that we're not have. That can happen. So which means we just we we do cesarean section, right? Uh, after how long is this becoming that it cannot go? Ah, that's a very good question. It's case to case basis. So that's the time when you have to the, as long as as much as possible you want to deliver naturally. It depends on the baby. If the baby is still okay, then we usually wait. And if the mother is also okay. But then once, you know, the, the, the vitals are no longer normal, then maybe you should schedule for cesarean. It's just there. It, it depends. Uh, uh, what about the induced labor? Oh, induced labor. I was induced. It depends on the mom, right? So let's say a mom is prone to preeclampsia or like for me, I have a, a, a bleeding problem. So to prevent that from happening, I induce labor. There's so many conditions for induced labor. Is yeah. it harmful for the baby to stay more than 40 weeks? Who's the boss? Who, who is the boss? The baby. The baby. The, the, as long as the placenta is intact, it's not harmful, right? Because um, my brother's wife, uh, they live in Mexico, and uh, the doctors were telling her that it was harmful for the baby to stay uh, because she was 40 weeks uh, already, <clears throat> and they didn't want to leave the baby there, so they make her uh, induce. You can induce, depends, but as long as the statistics of the baby the vital signs are okay. That's very safe there. Oh, but the, the longer <coughs> the baby stays in there, think about the poop and all the dirt. It's also there, doesn't it? And they're getting bigger. Yeah. 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 Hannah. So at some point, does the amniotic fluid start to decrease? Yeah. Yeah. So that's why. If you're, you're third and you're still in labor, usually they let you stay in the hospital right? or come, come in every single day, make sure you're ready. But there are some who are pregnant after 42 weeks and still in there. What can you do? As long as the baby is healthy. Okay. Okay, now let's breastfeed. Why do we want to breastfeed? Look, 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 and circle this. The first week, there's this colostrum. That's the most nutritious, nutritious of all. It contains the most abundant antibodies. And can you please write IgA, antibody A, which the baby will drink, and actually that antibody A will coat the lining of the GI tract of the baby and also coat the lining of the respiratory tract, that's where it goes. Which is good because the baby is born with sterile gut, sterile everything, it's protected. That antibody is the only content of breast milk that cannot be or has never been replicated in any formula out there in the market because antibodies can easily be nature. You can, it doesn't have a shelf life. So the best is breast milk. Breast milk, why is it also very ideal? Because the nutrients in breast milk are simple. Remember the baby's born with a digestive system that's not fully functional yet. That's why babies who are formula, there is okay, there's nothing wrong, right? But babies who are formula fed, uh, it's harder for them to digest the, the milk in formula because their digestive system is not fully functional yet. So they'll have more bowel movement. They're not as, they're, they're usually smaller than their counterparts, but they get big, no problem. It's just that they're, it's just easier, this one and portable, see? You don't have to worry about making it. All you need to do is just bring it out. <laughs> okay? 
Now, any, any question on breastfeeding and then the advantage of breast milk? Don't forget colostrum, don't forget antibody A. Question? What else is the advantage? Because of that, that antibody, what type of immunity is that? Natural or artificial acquired? Natural. Naturally acquired what? Passive or active? Passive. Very good, because the baby doesn't have to do anything. It's a naturally acquired passive immunity. That is so protective. Breastfed babies usually have very minimal visits to the ER. I breastfed really until she was three. Zero visits to the ER. Zero. Of course, when the baby, the, by the time the, what, by six months we start feeding, adding food, right, to the baby, because it's not enough. Breast milk is not enough to sustain them. Okay? And we encourage just high fat in the beginning because we think about the nervous system and all the body systems that need the fat. But then once they become two years old, we switch them to 2% fat so that they don't become too much in those fat adipose. So the last part of this chapter talks about genetics. And like I said, we're just going to go over the a few things. You must know the difference between genotype and phenotype. Genotype refers to the genetic code, right? And then pheno, PH for physical expression. The one that you see, right? let's say you have brown eyes, that's the phenotype of your genetic code. Okay? You have hairs coming out of your ears, your nose. That's the phenotype of the genetic code from the dad. The hair sticking out of your ears and your nose, the that's inherited from the dad, right? Okay, you should be able to do Punnett Square, which I have worksheets for this one. But that's it. Do you, do you, and then predict the probability. So we have worksheets to practice on this one. Uh, let's say the probability that this will show is what? 0%, 25%, etc. You know how to do this one? Are you familiar with homozygous and heterozygous? What's allele? Allele is that from the dad and from the mom, right? Then um, I'm going to talk about this one. It's called co-dominant, the ABO. So uh, we're familiar with dominant and recessive. Mm -hmm. If you have both dominant, then you're homozygous dominant. Both recessive, homozygous recessive. Blood typing is different. This is called co-dominant. Both of them will have to be expressed. If you got A and B, both of them will express. So you have AB. That's co-dominant. And that's it for this. And you see, oh, last, last, last is there. But this one, see, if you're... If you're, if that's why you can have an O, it depends. If is your blood type AO, right? So you need to remember this one. You see, if you're AB, AB, you can be A, B, or AB, it's called dominant. And then lastly, I want you to be able to um, detect if you're given an, a karyotype like this, is this a male karyotype or a female karyotype? No. The everything from one to see there's twenty two X or twenty two XY, right? So this is forty four, one from the mom, one from the dad, right? So there's two, four, six, eight, etc. Now you have forty four. Remember, twenty three is from the mom and twenty three is from the dad. And then you have X that you got from the mom, you have Y that you got from the dad. You will know that this is a male karyotype because one sex chromosome is shorter. There's, uh, there's more X-linked traits than Y. They have a smaller arm than the X chromosome. If you see that, then you know that that's a male. For a female, it should be the same size. Okay, and that's it. There's some examples here of 
what's dominant and what's recessive, but that's it. There's no questions about polygenic inheritance. It's just straight Punnett square, which I have this worksheet that we can work on. Okay, so I'm going to distribute this 